Yeah. So um, we have uh, several meetup uh, in our meetup page. If you haven't visited, the next one is going to be also in San Francisco. Uh, going to be talking about deep learning on the real time anom uh, the anomaly detections. So that should be a good talk. Uh, and the next month, so uh, which I haven't announced yet, I'm actually going to announce next week. Uh, it's going to be a meetup at a uh, GoPro, uh, where uh, my team at a GoPro uh, actually going to talk about the, our work uh, using Spark, you know, Spark Streaming, Kafka, and how the data pipelines and plus the analytics we've done on the on the drones on the uh, the cameras. So uh, so we're going to give a free uh, some. <laughs> Free uh, GoPro cameras as well. So, uh, so. <laughs> but today we have a special talk, and uh, from Yahoo, uh, you know, Andy is the VP of our, uh, the infrastructure architect, and, uh, and they are the group who actually originally created Hadoop, and uh, now, um, and now they are, you know, do a lot of research in, in uh, innovating stuff. And before they have done the coffee on Spark, and this time going to be uh, on the Spark, uh, the TensorFlow on Spark. And uh, we have uh, the, uh, the other engineers who is here. Oh, where is it? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so they, they're going to show the details of how, how this new, new framework works. And, and they, they, you know, Yahoo, like always, they, they not only open source the Hadoop, but then this time they open source the TensorFlow on Spark. So with that, let's welcome Andy and, uh, and Lee. Good evening. It's kind of loud. So uh, 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 my name is Andy Feng. I'm from Yahoo. And uh, I'm going to uh, visit my friend Lee going to try to cover the new open source project we just released uh, called the TensorFlow on Spark. So I think the, from the, uh, just to make sure, uh, so the reviews, I will try to cover the high level fluffy stuff. And then Lee will cover all the details. So like all of the, so, so we will start, so I will cover the overviews and then yeah, Lee going to talk about the design architecture API, give you a nice demo. You know, we, I, you know I, if you guys want me to cut down my fluffy stuff, I'll be happy to cut it down as much as you like. Okay, and then so that you guys could dive deep into the details. Okay, so before I start, I'd like to ask, how many of you have been using TensorFlow? How about the Spark? That's amazing, that's amazing. So, the, so what we try to do here is try to bring two you know, popular framework together, right? Because it's all believe the deep learning make a difference because of data. And then also because of the, you know, in order to do all the job, you need the computation powers. So that's why we want to bring the TensorFlow and the Spark together. So then the, so the, as Chester mentioned, right, so why Yahoo guys are doing this kind of thing, right? And I just wanted to remind you, you know, we have been, Yahoo have been doing the open source for a long, long time, right? We, uh, you know, about more than 10 years ago, uh, we started the Hadoop project and then, you know, we, I remember I was uh, giving a keynote speech on the Spark 2013 at the first Spark Summit. I think the number of people may be this much, you know. And then the last year we uh, uh, did the job to try to bring uh, a deep learning framework called CAFE and, and make it that on the Spark. And then this year uh, in, uh, in February, uh, we open sourced the uh, TensorFlow uh, on Spark here. So the idea here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what we try to leverage is the computation power and the data, right? So because of our historical investment in the Hadoop land, so inside the Yahoo, we have uh, one of the largest clusters, Hadoop clusters in the world. So we have like about, you know, uh, I was uh, near 50,000 machines in it. Right, and then the, then with those machines, like almost all the data you could imagine that you know, Yahoo has is available on those clusters, right? So from that point of view, 
we think, you know, with all the advanced technology like the TensorFlow, all those things, we think it makes sense to, you know, uh, yeah, to bring together the advanced technology together so that we could uh, find interesting stuff inside in it. So the one of the early work in the deep learning uh, at Yahoo was our Flickr team. So what they did, uh, so we acquired uh, several startups. And at that point, we started, you know, the team in our Flickr, just uh, you know, one, a few blocks from here, they started building a cluster of GPU machines for the deep learning. Then on the other hand, they have been using our Hadoop clusters for the data processing. So they tend to do their, you know, if you imagine the work they have been doing in that time period was like, if they do deep learning on this set of GPU machines, and then using the Hadoop on the other side to do the, like a pretty data processing, all those stuff. So then you're kind of moving the thing between them, right? So then what's the impact was, like after we, uh, you know, the company, so the, so the two companies was acquired by Yahoo, uh, a Flickr team for about one year. The amount of the progress that has been made on the deep learning was quite limited, right? So then, on the other hand, um, because I was the chief architect of our Hadoop team, they keep com complaining about, you know, how difficult it has been to move in the data between those two clusters. So, you know, your pipe, you know, pipeline is not big enough, or something messed up, all those complaints, you will show up. So, you know, can you do this, you can't do that. So we, we then we thought, you know, in order to, you see, you know, our team has a, all the headache, and then from business point of view, it's not making as much progress as we wished from, you know, acquisition point of view. So then, so, you know, why don't we provide a technology, like, the, you know, make the deep learning directly available on the Hadoop cluster, right? So that was the reason, uh, uh, you know, we started the work on the Cafe on Spark. And then almost the same reasons that why this year we open sourced the TensorFlow on Spark. Because if you think about it, like the, the TensorFlow until now, right, was the, it come with a very basic distributed mechanism, right? And in order, when you do that job, is basically say, here's my 10 GPU machines or CPU machines that I have, and over there, I want to do my distributed training, right? And then, again, logically, it's the same picture I was showing you before. Then if, if we could bring the, all the deep learning TensorFlow things on this huge cluster, right? Then imagine what you could do, right? You could say, okay, I have a job. I wanted to use 100 machines, you know, 1,000 machines, if you wish, right? And then you could access all the data you have, you know, in your cluster. So then you know, no more, you know, I needed to deal with like, those guys say, okay, I could not move my data, you know, all those kind of, you know, all those headache, you know, all data scientists would wish never needed to deal with, right? Those are probably, you know, has been solved by the men of the framework like Spark or those things, right? So there's no reason for you know, each of us try to come up with another solutions. So that was the desire on it, right? So that's why you know, at this point, at Yahoo, we are doing you know, uh, all those the machine learning, deep learning, our data you know, analytics, everything is on that Hadoop cluster. Right? So then you will wonder, you see, you know, hasn't somebody else did this thing before? And we thought, you know, as an open source guy, we, that was our first reaction, you know. Let's find something else, somebody else did it. Let's, uh, let, you know, either just using that thing, because we as an engineer, I selected this engineer, you know, job, tried to be lazy, right? But unfortunately, at that point, when we look into it, we found there were two, two minor projects. One is from a, a to a PhD student, student at UC Berkeley called SparkNet. And then there was a, another project uh, uh, from uh, data, uh, Databricks. It's a spin off of the Berkeley, I think their headquarters is like a few blocks from here. So the, we look into both of them, we found you know, this does not really fit the view we wanted to 
It's a problem we try to solve. So first of all, what they try to do is, if you look into the, it, it, the thing what we wanted to do here is that we wanted to solve, enable any type of the TensorFlow applications be able to run on Spark. And both the Spark and the TensorFlow solutions, they has been built heavily influenced by the traditional Spark architecture. If you imagine, right, if you think about the MLLib or many other Spark uh, applications, like you have a driver, you have a bunch of the, you know, a, a, a dozen of the executors. And the driver decides what the each executor needed to do, or the executor do their job, then communicate back to the driver, right? So then you, then you think, then what's going to happen is uh, your driver becomes the bottleneck because that's the only one guy, you know, one, one machine, one process is running there, waiting for everybody, you know, independent of how many you execute you have. Then the other side is the, because the nature of that architectures, then all those, uh, the, orgs, the set of the TensorFlow algorithm you could support by this, uh, by the Spark traditional architecture is the always synchronous learning. So if you imagine, you know, you have, uh, you know, you launch a thousand machines do the synchronous learning, then your slowest machine, you will become, you know, dragging your whole thing down, right? Then the other side is, uh, you know, sometimes your model may be so big that you may want to, your model is safe, could not fit on single machine. Then what do you do with it? Like in the Spark-based machine learning framework, tended to only deal with the data parallelism, right? Then the other, if you think about the, what made the TensorFlow so popular? Among many other reasons, right? Among the others, you know, um, community support, all the Google investment, all those things. And then also it comes with some of the interesting tools, which I mean many of our data scientists love to use, right? For such as a tensor board, right? You, unfortunately, once you go down a traditional, simple, Spark architecture, tensor board won't be available for you. So then if you're thinking, you know, if you're thinking all those things, right? With all those limitations, if uh, you adopt those, then you know you kind of you, you know it could be a, become a very limited adoptions you could have, right? I mean that's exactly what happened. If you're looking into those two framework, has been in the marketplace for quite, for quite a while. The adoption has been very limited. So it's our hope here is that we want to bring the uh, we want to have TensorFlow on Spark enable all of your TensorFlow applications be able to scale up. And we want to enable you to leverage all those powers of TensorFlow, all the powers of the Spark. And we also want to make your life really easy. Right, so that's our wish list. So let's see, I think, so uh, leave you explains how we accomplish all those goals. And then, before I hand over to him, I want to show you a few things. So the architecture we are going to put together is going to be as scalable as a standalone TensorFlow cluster. So we leverage, we wanted to leverage Spark to bring a large number of the server together. But once I bring them together doing the job, I wanted to have a Spark almost doing nothing to impact my scalability to everything, right? I, I wanted the driver just to get out of the way. So the, here is the you know, early benchmark we had. Here is this one of the popular uh, model, Inception, uh, I think this is the Inception 3. And then if you're looking into the uh, accuracy uh, uh, over there, zero point was seven two or something. And if we look there, you will compare the time. Essentially, we you know you could see this essentially achieves the linear scalability as Google has published. So.
So we look confirm from this number, what we confirmed is the architecture we are bringing together is really as good as a, a you know a dedicated TensorFlow cluster. Okay. Then the we thought you know once we do all those things, maybe we should do slightly more, right? Then the, the other side, if you look into the Google things, like when you do the distributed trainings, so then you, assuming many of you have not looked into the details of how they do the distributed training, right? So you, during the distributed training, you need to communicate, communicate once all the server with one another. Then Google I did is use, introduce a protocol, a gRPC things for the communication between all your servers. And then if you know, if you are familiar with gRPC, gRPC is an RPC protocol on top of Ethernet. So for Google, they have a very fast Ethernet, right? So unfortunately for a small company like Yahoo, we do not have a fast network. But we could afford to, you know, for among our GPUs, we could afford to put something called the infinite band or something in it. Right? So here is the result for the, you know, once we put the, so we enhance the TensorFlow with the uh, RDMA support so that the, from one server, I could directly access the G, GPU memories of the another server, right? And as here is the, you know, if you look into the, uh, this is a speed up uh, from the, uh, for the VGG uh, network, it could be quite significant, right? If for the, to achieve the, for single machine, in order to achieve the, you know, accuracy was a, Zero point eight a little bit, and over there was the two hundred over the two hundred thirty hours, and then here with the for yeah, once we uh, was uh, we bring the two machine together, then what's the, how much machine? Here? Oh yeah, uh, the, so both of the two machines. The one is the Ethernet, right? For the Ethernet here is the two hundred thirty hours also, also, and with the RDMA it's less than 100 hours. So, you know, so I think the, it's a, uh, so this piece of the code has been, actually was a uh, really, you know, uh, got a huge interest from Google guys. And we just uh, published a pull request last night. And the Google guys give us a call today, so, you know, we are eager to merge it in any minutes you guys want. So that's amazing, I say, you know. So I think you know I think it is the, I think this is the kind of the power of the open source, right? You know, you build on each other's technology and make this uh, whole industry better. So with that, I think I'm going to give little Lee talk away with you about the magic. Okay. So uh, as Andy mentioned, we had some goals in mind when we built this thing. Uh, the first one was to scale up your existing TensorFlow apps with as few lines of code changes as possible. Uh, we wanted to let your researchers and scientists essentially take what they've built on their laptops and deploy it on the grid. So uh, supporting things like synchronous, asynchronous, uh, training, model data parallelism, and uh, as he mentioned, running TensorBoard on the same cluster. So uh, the other important bit that we came across uh, is the fact that TensorFlow has right now two, maybe three, if you count this new thing, uh, modes of ingesting data into your TensorFlow graph. Uh, the one that they originally shipped with was this feed dictionary business. Uh, most of their samples were uh, give, sent out using feed dicks. And then uh, somewhere around early, whatever, before, before, just before 1.0 came out, uh, they 
we're starting to push this notion of a reader or a queue runner. Uh, and this is more of a mechanism for kind of reading directly from uh, your file system. And again, since Yahoo was a big investor of uh, you know, Hadoop and Hadoop clusters, we really wanted to be able to tie in with any existing data pipelines that we might have had in production. Uh, so having something like Spark, you could do all sorts of uh, pre-processing and go straight into TensorFlow. Um, and then obviously we wanted to be able to deploy on our cloud um, and for everybody else on premise or in the cloud. Okay, so what is it exactly? So at the most simple level, it's kind of a PySpark wrapper of your TensorFlow code. Uh, so it's some infrastructure that glues uh, TensorFlow to Spark uh, with your code in the middle. Uh, what it basically does is it uses Spark's fundamental mechanisms of executors uh, to launch the TensorFlow nodes on Spark executors. Uh, and while that might seem like a obvious, non, uh, obvious trivial thing to do, it's a little bit uh, trickier than that. Um, especially when it comes to these uh, other forms of data ingestion. So for instance, uh, the feed dictionary, if you look at the uh, TensorFlow examples, most of them just read the entire data set in memory, and then they'll just parcel out batches to your uh, execution graph. Uh, and in our world, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the RDD from the Spark side and feed that directly into your feed dictionary. Um, and then obviously we support TensorBoard uh, both during and after training. After is a, a new thing with TensorFlow 1.0, uh, mostly because they recently added support of running TensorFlow against uh, events and checkpoints that have been written to HDFS. Uh, in the 0.12 era, that wasn't exactly working. This is, the after training is fairly new. And then the other thing that's nice about all this is because we're kind of a PySpark application. Uh, it's generally agnostic to Spark and TensorFlow versions. Uh, and so as an example of that, we have tested uh, the system, or we've actually modified it a little bit, to support multiple different environments uh, from as low as Python 2.7, Spark 1.6, TensorFlow 0.12, to as high as 3x, Spark 2, and TensorFlow 1. And in fact, I'm playing with TensorFlow 1.1, which is a couple weeks ago. Okay. So at a high level, this is what it is. Uh, if you've played with Spark, there's generally a driver that uh, directs activities uh, to your executors. Most of the times, especially in the PySpark world, you're going to be executing some stateless lambda and returning the results to the driver, as Andy kind of alluded to. Uh, in our world, we're not gonna do that. We're basically using Spark just to launch your TensorFlow node. Uh, in, in the TensorFlow world, you, without this, you would get three boxes, or four boxes, and you would manually do Bazel run here, Bazel run here, Bazel run here, Bazel run here. And before you even did that, you had to come up with a cluster spec that tells you each of the nodes where all the other nodes were, uh, physical, host, and port. Uh, so if you can imagine trying to do this in a dynamic environment where executors are scheduled in random boxes, uh, random ports available, it, it's a little bit trickier. So in this particular case, uh, we, again, uh, underneath the TensorFlow core, we, we inserted our RDMA layer for the low-level communications. Um, but once we start the nodes, uh, they will set up the network, the TensorFlow cluster network, uh, by themselves, talk to each other, uh, and continue on from there, reading data from HDFS as needed. So the basics of how you would use this, uh, it's based, uh, three, three main steps. One, to start up the cluster on Spark with the executors. Uh, two is a little iffy, depends on which mode you use, we'll get into that later but uh, you need to get data into your execution graph for TensorFlow. And then three, uh, using typical Spark and Hadoop mechanisms, we wanna tear down the cluster nicely because this is a shared environment. We don't wanna leave nodes 
pain. So this is a very simplified version of what it takes to launch a cluster Spark using uh, TensorFlow and Spark. So the first step is uh, a recent <laughs> change, if you've been following us. Uh, we recently modified or combined two APIs into one, uh, a API called run. Uh, the first parameter is the typical Spark context that you might have in PySpark. The second parameter is uh, a map function, which really is your TensorFlow main function. If you've ever played with TensorFlow, typically you have a def main, which takes args that they throw away and, and does nothing else. Uh, in our case, we turn that into a, essentially a map function for Spark. Uh, we tweak a couple, we require you to add a couple arguments, um, and then otherwise it's mostly the same. Uh, the args here are essentially the command line arguments that you would have sent to your TensorFlow nodes anyways. If you looked at the TensorFlow examples, uh, they always use arg pars. They, a lot of times in the early days, were using this TF flags business. Uh, that was literally just parsing arguments on every executor, or sorry, every node. In this case, because we're in Spark, what we're doing is we're taking the command line arguments that you had put on your driver, or shipping them to all the executors and all the, all the TensorFlow nodes so that they could do their arg parse. TF flags business. Uh, then num executors is literally the size of the cluster you want to run. Uh, num ps uh, is the number of parameter servers you want to run. And it's mostly special because uh, TensorFlow has the node uh, notion of a job name, whether or not you are a worker node or whether or not you are a ps node. So in this case, we just uh, stand up num ps TensorFlow. PS nodes, and then everything else is good. And the next argument is whether or not you would want to launch a TensorBoard process on your cluster. And then finally, this little thing called the input mode. So if you recall, I mentioned that there are two modes, uh, feed dictionary and queue runner. So that would be specified there. And if you are in the feed dictionary um, mode, where we're taking Spark RDDs and trying to push them to a feed dictionary, you could use either train or inference. Um, in this case, train, if you're familiar with Spark, is a lot like a for each partition. Uh, it basically just blasts the data out uh, to the executors, uh, whereas inference is more like a map partitions dot collect. Uh, we're expecting data coming back out. So the nice thing about that is, uh, We've essentially connected the output of TensorFlow to a Spark RDD, and then you can, you know, you did your pre-processing, you do your uh, TensorFlow uh, modeling or inference, and then you could potentially get an RDD back and continue on with your feed pipeline, whatever, whatnot. And finally, shut down. Okay, so this is a fun example I pulled out of my out of our code uh, when we were open sourcing or, or preparing to open source uh, this, we took on the exercise in modifying a lot of the existing TensorFlow examples uh, for TensorFlow and Spark, just to see if we could run this on our cluster and also to see how easy it was to migrate. This happens to be the simplest case. Uh, it's actually the evaluation job for uh, slim inception. <laughs> yeah, if you, we, we have a source code available. Uh, but I say it's the simplest because it's literally a single node TensorFlow uh, app that runs the evaluation job that pairs with a training. Um, but in order to run this on your Hadoop cluster, this is what it needs. And if you look at it, most of it is like PySpark, you know, uh, just PySpark imports and PySpark uh, setup. And the rest of it is TensorFlow and Spark. And like I said, we ask you to change your main function a little bit to take some arguments that we'll be playing with here. So that's a very simplified ver version. The, uh, obviously, the more complex your, your app gets, there might be more bits in here. OK, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the input modes, because it's kind of important as you guys go forward and start to play with this. 
So as I mentioned, the Spark mode literally tries to feed the RDD directly to your feed dictionary. Uh, we say here that it's mostly meant for small, medium scale data. Uh, because A, feed dictionaries were mostly meant for small and medium scale data. And B, uh, connecting the Spark RDDs to your TensorFlow feed dictionary, there's a little bit of work involved. And so we are copying some data around. Uh, and so there might be some performance hits maybe. Uh, depends on if you are IO limited or uh, GPU, CPU limited. And the TensorFlow mode, uh, like I mentioned, they're, they're pushing for that. The good news is you can read directly from HDFS. Uh, that was a fairly <laughs> recent advance in the TensorFlow world. Uh, and they recommend this for large scale data. And there's a couple benefits to this. Uh, well, they actually recommend a thing called a TF record, uh, that you write your data in a TF record. It's a, essentially a protobuf format. Uh, but basically they're, they're trying to, I guess they were trying to optimize the path for TF records. Uh, but again, if you have an existing pipeline and you don't have uh, the capability to convert everything to TF records, we allow you to have this. Um, now, the way input mode Spark works. So in most Spark applications, actually in PySpark applications, uh, there's actually a little Python process that's handling the lambdas that go to each executor. Uh, so if I add, you know, whatever, uh, two numbers on the workers, that JVM executor is gonna hand off the work to a little Python process. That Python process is gonna crunch the numbers and then return the results. In our case, we are going to run TensorFlow on these guys. So the parameter server is a little bit special. We want to actually run it on the main Python worker because we actually want this guy to block any further tasks. Uh, if you recall the data feeding operation, um, we don't want an RDD uh, feed to land on this box. We actually want it to land those two boxes. Uh, so what we do is we run the TensorFlow nodes in a background process uh, along with a queue. Again, I mentioned the data copy there. And then once we launch these processes, these executor task slots are now available for data feeding. So after uh, we launch the processes, it's a standard TensorFlow uh, cluster. Those guys will connect to each other using the cluster spec. And then we'll start feeding. So now when we do RDD for each partition, uh, little chunks of RDDs will arrive at each of the executors that are available. We will actually copy it into this intermediate queue. And then when you call feed dict uh, on your TensorFlow app, it will, will actually read the data from the queue. Okay. Now, TensorFlow mode, like I said, is slightly different. What we're gonna do is we're basically gonna run everything directly on the worker. The workers will connect to each other, form the cluster, and then the workers themselves with the TF runners, TF readers, Q runners, will read directly from HDFS. So why did I go through all that? <laughs> because there's uh, some consequences to your choices. So uh, first of all, failure recovery is important to everybody, especially at large scale. Uh, and the Main thing that TensorFlow emphasizes and that we will em emphasize is that checkpoints are your friends. Uh, so definitely checkpoint early and often. Well, checkpoint enough to be happy. Um, you don't want to be, you know, four days into a training job uh, and have a failure uh, without a checkpoint. Uh, if you are writing checkpoints and you're, you know, three and a half days in, uh, the good news is if there's any failure, you can restart your job. It'll load the checkpoint from the last saved instance and con continue from there. So um, as I mentioned before, in the Spark mode, your TensorFlow worker is running in the background. One of the consequences of that is that uh, any failures in that process will not be caught by Spark. It's a, literally a kind of like a background thread that nobody's listening to. Uh, on the contrary, the data feeding task will be retried. 
so as I'm feeding RDDs into these nodes, uh, let's say we had a, a task failure, maybe there was a, a disk block issue, um, that feeding would actually get retried and pushed to your executor. Um, okay, and then on the TensorFlow side, uh, as since you're running in the foreground, any failures in your workers will be retried. Uh, now this retry is a little bit trickier. Uh, it's essentially the same level of recovery that whatever TensorFlow provides today, which is uh, if a non-chief worker fails, it will try and start up, it will try and load from last save checkpoint, it will try and synchronize the state and try and continue from there. Um, there's different modes of failure for PSs and chief workers. I won't get into that. You guys can read up on that. Um, but yeah, some things you consider as you're choosing which mode to, to use. Okay, uh, now that said, what I talked about before on failure recovery was literally task failures and task recovery in Spark. Now, if an executor itself dies, uh, you're kind of out of luck, mostly because today when you create a TensorFlow cluster, the cluster spec is statically defined. Like I mentioned before, you have a list of four nodes and four ports, and you're sending that list to every node. So in Yarn, that's kind of hard to do. Your container might have gotten shot, you might end up on another node. Uh, even if you happen to be lucky and end up on the same node, your port might be gone, it might be taken up by some other process. So what we need is a dynamic port. Uh, that's not supported today in TensorFlow. We're chatting with the TensorFlow team, uh, but it's gonna take a little bit of work to get there. Okay, so just to kind of prove that we can do TensorBoard, <laughs> this is a, a quick snapshot from one of the jobs. MNIST, accuracy and loss, turn out images. Okay, so then I wanna talk a little bit about the typical application development flow that we've seen uh, with our users. Uh, typically, your labs and research guys will be playing on their laptops, as I mentioned before. Uh, they'll be playing with small scale data that fits on their laptops. They'll be iterating quickly on their TensorFlow graphs, trying to figure out the optimal weights, uh, optimal configuration of their neural network, et cetera. Uh, they'll typically be playing with uh, API, the basic APIs of TensorFlow, like graph and session. Now, at some point, things will start to converge. Things will start to look interesting to the labs guys. And what they'll do is they'll try typically to throw more data at it because most of us have learned recently, uh, typically machine learning uh, tends to train better models with more data. So they'll throw more data at it and sooner or later they'll run out of room somewhere, whether it doesn't fit on the box or whether the training takes you know five days or not. So they typically go into scaling phase uh, and as it, Andy alluded to, before this, what they would do is they would create their own cluster. Uh, and they would fill up whatever disk they had. And at this point, you would have to change your code a little bit to do distributed TensorFlow. You'll have to introduce the notion of a cluster spec and a server, maybe saver and supervisor. Actually, how many of you guys have tried distributed TensorFlow? Would be a small number, yeah. <laughs> okay, great, all right. Now you can. So uh, once, you, once you get to uh, scale, uh, sorry, let me go back a little bit. So generally what happens in this case is they'll get to a really good model that takes you know, a couple days to train at whatever uh, gigabytes to petabytes, whatever of data that might fit on that local disk. Uh, but then they want to get to production. And now they've, as, he, as Andy alluded to, they've got this dedicated cluster on the side, they've got an actual production cluster over here, and they're gonna have to like cross weird firewalls and, and ship data back and forth, and it's kind of a mess. So, production. In this mode, what you wanna do is you want, ideally, your training and your inference on your production cluster. And you wanna tie it in directly to your data pipeline. Whatever's producing the data that you're training on or that you wanna do inference on, ideally you want it on that same box. You don't wanna copy that data around. And in this mode, uh, you will start to use our APIs, uh, as I mentioned before. And then 
one day soon, <laughs> will integrate with TensorFlow Serving. Okay, so quick demo. This is just gonna be the Spark standalone that uh, if any of you have not tried before, we'll get to see. So I've got some pre-canned instructions. I'll basically go through it real quick. So for Spark standalone, this is just setting up some basic uh, environment variables for Spark itself and for uh, TensorFlow and Spark. Uh, you'll note I'm creating a fairly small cluster at this point, two uh, workers, just because this is my laptop. And then we'll go ahead and start Spark standalone. You'll see that it starts two workers. Do I need to make that bigger? Okay, so we've got our uh, workers started. If you go to localhost, you'll see a Spark job running. Uh, or sorry, just, this is literally just the Spark cluster. Okay. And I'm gonna skip this step because it doesn't really do anything right now. But uh, what we did as part of this step is uh, MNIST right now ships as kind of num zipped NumPy arrays. And for Hadoop, uh, in particular for, for demonstrating things like RDDs, I wanted to have uh, the files split up a little into part files and something that we could kind of dip through an RDD. Uh, and then this other, one of the other reasons for doing this is I actually wanted to convert it to CSV because a lot of us have text formatted files that we try and ingest. So just to demonstrate that. So here are the actual files. So you'll see that if I look at one of them in NIST, MNIST is like the hello world of deep learning. So you'll see that uh, MNIST is literally just uh, byte values of you know, grayscales uh, indicating numbers. Okay. And so this is what it takes to run our application. We'll go over this a little bit. So obviously we're doing Spark Submit uh, because we're using Spark. And there are a couple things. We are shipping our TensorFlow and Spark uh, library right now as a zip file. We might turn it into a pip install soon in the future. Uh, we're also shipping some extra bits of code out to the executors. We have some typical Spark setup uh, configurations. This line is our main driver, if you will, for Spark, for MNIST Spark. And then everything here on is uh, command line args that go into that args uh, data structure. It goes straight to your TensorFlow application. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run this. Uh oh, <laughs> hopefully that wasn't a problem. Okay, all right. Spark to run. Something weird with the loop back. So I'll go by. So not on. Okay. Let me try something real quick. Things that work perfectly elsewhere never work when you're going to demo.
Yeah, it looks like I'm still having network issues. Dang. Oh, wait, I think there's a thing I can do. At this point. If not, then you're just going to have to take my word for it. <laughs> Oh, it, do you think do you think I can try that? I don't think it'll resolve. Oh, it's my password. What was that? Welcome to the party. The password is that right? last attempt. Looks a little better, huh? Okay, all right. So let's refresh. Okay, so finally, I just had to connect to Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you'll see that our uh, Spark application is running. Uh, you'll see that uh, it's got two workers. Now, this is actually running in Spark mode, so it's kind of funny. We actually run uh, these two Spark jobs in parallel. The first one was starting the cluster, and you'll see that one of, a, one of the tasks is finished and one of them is not. The one that is not is actually the parameter server uh, because we're blocking that guy. Uh, so then, when we run the second job in parallel, uh, the data feeding tasks, these, these uh, Spark tasks will only land on the available worker because this guy, the other uh, parameter server node is tied up. Okay, so the nice thing about modeling as a one TensorFlow node per executor is that the executor logs map directly to your TensorFlow logs. So this is one TensorFlow node. You can see all the things that it's spitting out. Uh, you can see that this is worker zero. And here it is, uh, created the session, and it's already starting to train MNIST. Okay. So this is going to go on for a while. One of the things, other things I wanted to show you was this nice little TensorBoard thing. So in this case, we're launching TensorBoard on one of the workers. And it, we have the full capability to you know, get your summaries and statistics. We can view the graph, images, uh, and then you can even view distributions of your weights, let's say. And TensorFlow has two different versions of viewing distributions. I'll let you guys sort that out offline. <laughs> Um, but basically, that is uh, running on my Spark cluster, feeding data as we speak for, you know, in iterations of whatever the, uh, whatever I had set. Now, again, the good news is I can, let me double check. I have a model being written right now uh, with checkpoints. You'll see that the time date stamp, time stamp is, uh, basically 739 right now. So if I happen to kill this, which I might, um, you should be able to just run it again from that checkpoint. In fact, I will. Because now I want to go on to uh, running inference. So in this, in this mode, as I mentioned before, we're running a kind of a Spark map partitions collect uh, through your TensorFlow app. And this should go fairly quickly because uh, the number of test samples is only 10,000. 
times a batch size of 100. But again, the nice thing is that uh, you know you have your spark logs, you can do yarn log to capture things. Uh, we, we're leveraging all the infrastructure that's already in place for yarn, um, et cetera. You don't have to go collect your own TensorFlow logs. Oh, looks like it finished. OK, so that finished fairly quickly. And just to see, um, we can take a look at the predictions that it got spit out. Uh, you'll see that they were written a minute ago. And we just look at some of the output. We're, we're actually outputting the actual whole string. Uh, but you can see the predictions are pretty good. Uh, there's always one about here where we miss. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be a five, but it's actually a six. Uh, or we predicted a six, sorry. Um, and a lot of times that could just be the, the scribble and scrawl of the actual MNIST sample. If you've looked at some of them, they're, they're humorous sometimes. Okay, so, um, so that was our demo. What I wanted to get into next, and, and like I said, we, we have examples for MNIST. We have an example for uh, Inception, which is also available on the GitHub site. We have an example for uh, the CIFAR 10 data set. Uh, that came from the TensorFlow guys. Uh, that particular uh, sample is actually a single node multi-GPU configuration, so that's interesting, whereas most of these other ones are multi-node single GPUs. And then we also have Slim, although Slim, if you've been following TensorFlow, is kind of going on the wayside in favor of Keras and Layer. Okay, so. As I mentioned, uh, the examples are here. I'm gonna, are we good? Okay, so one thing I wanted to kind of cover is, uh, I, could, I did kind of gloss over the MNIST example a little bit. I wanted to take you through the code a little bit just to see uh, what was involved. So this is the driver. And as I mentioned before, a lot of it is boilerplate for PySpark and, and or TensorFlow. Um, the key bit being our imports. And in this particular case, we're importing the MNIST uh, TensorFlow graph as a separate file. Uh, otherwise, it's mostly Spark and PySpark, mostly argparse. Um, there's a little bit of fun that w I was playing with here uh, that I'll just briefly cover. Um, because we're trying to validate uh, this mode with different data formats and different ways of ingestion, I actually implemented a matrix where we have a data format which is either a TF record or a CSV. And then we ran that on either Spark mode or TensorFlow mode. So that all was tested out. But in our case, we were running the CSV. And you'll see that I loaded it using standard PySpark. Uh, just a text file, map through a lambda to split on commas and create ints. Okay, that turns into uh, basically uh, an int array in TensorFlow land. And then here's our main method, as I mentioned before. This is us feeding the data. This is the inference. And again, the inference returns an RDD that we can then do any RDD operations on. In particular case, we're just saving it back out, and then we shut down. Now, the actual TensorFlow code pretty much resides in here, this in this dist. And in this case, this is the map function that I alluded to earlier. This is a wrapper of what, you, or a replacement of what used to be your main function. Uh, and then we ask that you, in addition to the args that you mostly ignored in the past, we ask that you capture the second argument, which we use. Uh, it's basically the context uh, metadata for this node with respect to the cluster. Um, and you'll see here, we're actually extracting some key bits out, like uh, what, what job you're actually operating as, whether you're the worker or the parameter server. Um, what task index were you? Were you worker zero or worker 100? Uh, and then the cluster spec, which we end up using, this is actually the TensorFlow cluster spec. Uh, oh, sorry, this is our definition of cluster spec, and this is the TensorFlow cluster spec. Um, it's actually just wrapped it. So again, 
we have an API that launches the gRPC server for this node, depending on its content, uh, well, telling it which role it's playing in the cluster. Uh, this is literally how many GPUs to load, whether or not we want to use RDMA or not. Uh, this is the feed dictionary, which is fairly standard. If you've ever played with uh, TensorFlow distributed, you will almost always see something like this, which is uh, if I am a parameter server, I do basically nothing. I start up the server and I just hit join. Uh, this happens to be one of the tricks of TensorFlow and Spark, or the tricky parts of it. Uh, in most cases, when you do this with a normal TensorFlow cluster, this job just runs forever. Nobody tells it to shut down, ever. Um, and so that's one of the things that we were trying to solve as well, because we don't want to leave nodes uh, and jobs running forever on a Hadoop cluster. Okay, um, again, this is a distributed TensorFlow thing, not specifically for us. The rest of this is kind of a standard TensorFlow uh, graph. Most of it is very standard. And then here we provide a helper function to turn uh, relative paths to HDFS paths. And if you provide the scheme up front, we'll avoid modifying it, but if you provide a relative path, we'll try and use it. If you manage the paths yourself, you can avoid this call. Um, let's see what else is there. Okay, and then here is a specific class that we use to kind of capture the state of your data feeding. It's kind of, you can think of it kind of as a cursor through your RDD um, so that we will use it to grab batches and at the same time, we have some state that tells TensorFlow if you've read through the entire cursor or not, and whether you need to. Um, otherwise, this is fairly standard TensorFlow. Here, we're returning the results back to the RDD for inferencing. So we actually, once you read a batch from the feed dict, we provide kind of the, uh, the opposite path to send results back out. And uh, a little bit of boilerplate to essentially terminate the feeding if for some reason TensorFlow decides that you should be done. So if you have a TensorFlow metric that says stop at accuracy, whatever, uh, but you're still feeding partitions, this is just a way to tell Spark to cut it up. Okay, so that was kind of a high level of how that works. So a couple gotchas. Um, since we've open sourced this thing, we've had some folks using it, and some folks uh, typically get tripped up in this notion of running multiple tasks on an executor. Uh, generally, what folks want to do is they want to say, hey, I've got four GPUs, or sorry, I've got four cores. Uh, I really want to run four tasks uh, and, and on this node. But in our world, you know, a task is very different than a Spark task. A Spark task was a, you know, a, a lambda, a compute operation. So you can parallelize that. Whereas in our world, uh, a task is literally your TensorFlow node. So make sure you're kind of configured for one task per node. Um, and then trust me, TensorFlow will try and take all the compute and memory it wants. Um, and then finally, uh, HDFS access. So there's been some work on the TensorFlow side to allow this. Uh, there's Jonathan. Uh, over at Google has been working on this ecosystem project to integrate TensorFlow with Hadoop and Mesos and all this other stuff. Uh, it's still a little bit early. A lot of people are tripping over things like, where are my native libraries installed on my particular installation of Hadoop, uh, if it's a non-standard installation. So if you ever see like that, beware. Okay, so where are we headed next? So uh, layers, obviously TensorFlow wants to be uh, going towards kind of like a high level API using layers. Uh, that just came out, uh, I have yet to integrate it, or, uh, totally integrate it. And secondly, as I mentioned, failure recovery, dynamic cluster management. In summary, uh, we're bringing deep learning to big data clusters. We support multiple versions. Uh, we even have an EC2 image, and we provide RDMA 
for those of you with uh, only normal Ethernet. <laughs> okay. Questions? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Hold on a second. Getting a um, Pass the mic. On the nodes in your cluster, yes. are they GPU, CPU, can they be either? I yeah. don't, regular TensorFlow, you have the choice, but what do you have in TensorFlow on Spark? Correct, that's a good question. So normally Hadoop grids are all CPUs. Uh, at Yahoo, we have a GPU-capable grid. Uh, and in fact, that particular grid is a mixed node environment. And what we've done is we've placed the GPU nodes on a separate queue. So if you submit jobs to that queue, you can use GPUs. Any other questions? Sorry, he's going. Hey, mate, uh, do you have any advice for anyone who's on, you know, AWS and using S3? And because uh, you know S3 is an HDFS, so I'm just, well, what's your advice there? I don't know. Yeah, uh, that one? Yeah, I think it's, uh, that's a very good question. So until now, we, we have provided an EC2 image, but uh, we have not looked into the S3 integration. I think our hope will be, I think, you know, I think the Spark actually already have some S3 integration. I think, you know, if any of you wanted to spend a little bit of time on it, we will be happy to support you. Otherwise, it's a, you know, it's a one of the, you know, action items on our list. I guess the uh, other thing I can say about that is if you can already run a Spark job in that environment and read data from S3, you could go the RDD route and feed that uh, into your TensorFlow, assuming you have everything else set up. We have a question in the front, or we had. <laughs> yeah. Time to support her here. You plan to support Keras or anything? Yeah, that's actually hinted at in our layers, <laughs> next steps. So the, the reason why it's just listed as layers is because that's all kind of up in the air and being reworked right now on the TensorFlow side. Uh, there have been multiple forms of high-level APIs from the TensorFlow gut side, uh, from Slim to TF Contrib Learn to uh, Keras. Now, uh, they made a commitment publicly to say that they're moving to Keras. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Keras API is available in 1.1 as of a couple weeks ago under TF Contrib Keras. Uh, and then when they go to 1.2, it's gonna end up being TF Keras. Uh, so I've played with it a little bit. I've got a very basic sort of cluster barely running. Uh, I need to work on some rough edges. But, but the plan is to support it. Thank you. Okay, next. Um, can you give me any thoughts you have on how Spark structured streaming will work oh, that's going a good forward? Question. Um, we've had requests. <laughs> um, we actually don't play with structured streaming as much as you would think. Um, yeah, uh, and so so that is something that we would have to look into. I haven't, frankly, looked at it much. And again, we welcome contributions. Help the community. My, my question is, uh, do you know who is using TensorFlow on Spark on Mesos? On Mesos? And with Docker image or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Actually, they have the several. There's folks who've been yeah. trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, unfortunately, I, we don't gather statistics on who's tried and succeeded. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of hard to tell, you know, if folks have tried it and everything's great and we never hear from them, or, yeah. or if they tried it and it doesn't work and we never hear from them. So I was um, um, I was in one of this thing I saw was uh, was that what was it one week or two week after the release? I saw some Japanese blog post <laughs> using you know put the TensorFlow on Dockers, all those things. If, uh, I yeah. think I was there. Uh, if you can read Japanese, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's obviously, instructions yeah, out there. <laughs> in Japanese, yeah. Uh, another question is uh, about Yang and the uh, GPU. Uh -huh. um, seems yeah. there are some something not very major about the Yang yes. GPU support. Yes, right? that's a good question. So, so today, Yarn 
does not have GPUs as a schedulable quantity. Uh, right now, it schedules essentially compute and memory. Um, so what we've had to do in our GPU queue is we actually use one or the other as a proxy for a GPU. Uh, in our, our particular case, we use memory. So if you have, you know, whatever n GPUs, divide memory by n, uh, and you, you can kind of schedule by proxy that way. The, we have chatted with the, uh, specifically our, our own Hadoop team who are tied in, and who are committers. Uh, they've told us that the community seriously wants it. Uh, apparently there's a very strong support from Microsoft. They really want it. We really want it. Uh, so there are, there's I think an uh, issue open to get it incorporated, but there's debate about whether or not how to do it um, in the most efficient manner. But uh, we were told it won't be here like soon in the time frame that we need, <laughs> but maybe in the future. I got a question myself. Sure. <laughs> so have you looked at the deep learning for GA and, and using Spark and TensorFlow together on GPUs? And then there was a recent talk by Adam Gibson and in talking about how to use that in production. It's all, because it's all Java stack and there's no Python in it. Yeah. And then he claims that there's efficiencies rather than, you know, you put on the, the, the Python yeah. translation layer so you lost some of the efficiencies. Right. Yeah, I think Adam is there. Uh, you know, I think we have, uh, is this the same question as it came up even when we were working on the Cafe on, uh, Cafe on Spark? I think the, again, I think the, if you, I think we did some early benchmark compared with the deep, uh, you know, deep learning 4G versus like, you know, in the, in the Cafe on, uh, on Spark, those things. And the number was not in favor of the deep learning 4G. So I, I had a very nice conversation with Adam as my friend. Mm -hmm. And I think I will encourage him, you know, continue doing his good work. <laughs> but on the one hand, I think we are, I mean, at this point, we are not spending any time on the deep learning project. The other way to think about it is that uh, a lot of our work has been driven by our customers, which is literally like Yahoo Labs research, the things that they prefer. So one of the reasons. Sorry, TensorFlow in general? Uh, so uh, I think it's public. <laughs> so uh, one of the, like I said, one of the main reasons we got into this business was we had internal customers who were playing with TensorFlow, playing with deep learning. Um, predominantly that customer is Flickr. Uh, they do a lot of CNN work. Uh, if you've looked at, out in the like research and blog posts, uh, they've been doing quite a lot of work uh, with CNN. Uh, things like interestingness and beauty, uh, auto tagging, etc. And, and they've been using very various forms. Uh, they started with Cafe and Spark. They're also playing TensorFlow. Um, could you please elaborate more on the model parallelism? Ah, so the, yeah. the benchmark you provided is it um, model parallelism or data or both? Yeah, the benchmark was actually workers plus one parameter server. Um, I think the model fit on one parameter server, so it wasn't, there wasn't any need to scale it further. Uh, the one thing I forgot to show you on the MNIST example uh, is in TensorBoard, you can click on a little button that highlights the placement of the operations and the variables. Had I clicked on that, you would have seen that the, the variables are being placed on the PS and the operations are being placed on so um, in terms of scalability, theoretically, in TensorFlow, you can have n numbers of parameter servers. Um, we can, there's, that's why we had that numps argument. But in general, for these little examples, one. Um, I think the constraint for the parallelism, essentially, whatever the constraint comes with the TensorFlow. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. as you saw, the architecture, once it launches the cluster, yeah. it's just a TensorFlow cluster. Like you, you, I think whatever you know, a Google guy published over their scalability, that's what our number going to be. 
And, and predominantly the main constraint is just IO, because you're, you're copying yeah. weights back and forth. And they try and have some really good optimizations of when to copy or not. Um, but again, it's mostly them yeah. to their magic. So I actually, <laughs> during the various meetings with the TensorFlow team, I have been pushing them, say, you know, the reference, the a set of the algorithms that have been published, right? It's a very simple algorithms. So I have been encouraging them you know, to publish the model parallelism and many other algorithms on it. Hopefully very soon you will see the details from Google, guys. All right, last question. Um, so TensorFlow has a distributed mode on, on master. Similar to kind Spark. Of. Yeah, kind of. How is your stuff? How? So we're not actually trying to, say, change TensorFlow. We're actually mostly trying to launch TensorFlow on a Hadoop cluster. That's, that's kind of the key bit. Um, whatever TensorFlow does to set up its cluster, we, we let it do its thing. HDFS is, uh, yeah, the big connection to the data. Uh, if you're using the TF reader and rec uh, key runner, uh, otherwise, if you're using anything Spark-like, RDDs and feed dictionary. One of the things you can provide. Okay. All right, give another round of applause for the Yahoo team. <laughs> I, I have to apologize. I actually, when I do the initial introduction, I blank out when I introduce the. I was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no sorry, uh, Liang is the principal, you know, uh, engineers at Yahoo, and is uh, you know, doing the distributed systems. So sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you'll see you next time. Okay.